Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, awesome. Boone, that's funny that you brought that up earlier about don't tap out. Um, you know, that was 10 years ago. It was, it was, we were in the sanctuary. It was before all this was built. Uh, we watched Michigan lose to Louisville that night in the national championship game. And at that time, Pastor Randy Don Giovanni had a bunch of us just come up and kind of speak. And that was laying on my heart for some reason. And matter of fact, it was, it was for myself because there was nights that I was tapping out uh, with my own family. So tonight, just like any time, and I even tell the kids this on, um, in the class, when I'm speaking, I'm not just speaking to you guys. I'm speaking for myself. I'm far from perfect. It's a little close. Um, if I was perfect, we wouldn't need Jesus. And thank the good Lord we have Jesus. We're going to use that in a little bit, which is very unorthodox of me. Uh, but I'm going to go through a little introduction. For you that do not know who I am, my name is Pat uh, Lafreniere. I have a beautiful wife going on 15 years of marriage. Uh, she serves with me in this awesome ministry, Club 56. It's a fifth and sixth grade ministry. Um, I got two daughters. I got a fifth grader and I got a seventh grader. And I will sit back and say that I am blessed because my girls love the Lord and they want to be here. Uh, and I keep hearing, wait till they're teenagers. You know what? I won't speak that death over my kids. And I hope when you guys speak about your kids, don't speak that stuff. We didn't speak the terrible twos over them. I'm not going to. Because those words cut. And there's no way that I'll speak death over my daughters. My daughters are amazing, beautiful. First of all, I'm just basically renting them here on earth. They belong to the king. So um, I own a small construction business. It's just me. I got one other guy. Uh, we have fun. It's a, it's a blast. And my hobbies are pretty much like everybody else. I love hunting, fishing. Uh, I like to fish. Don't get me wrong. I like sports, football, boxing. Uh, that's about my hobbies go that far. I used to play softball with Billy for many, many years. But I always end up pulling a hamstring. I seem like all the time. So, uh, But yeah, those, that's, that's just a basic of me. I'm just a regular guy. I actually have fun. And yes, on a Wednesday night, I get to be a 12-year-old again, sometimes. Uh, I got great men in here that help out in my class, and I want to thank you guys, because without you guys, it just doesn't work out. Uh, we need you. And if you know somebody between the age of 20 and 35, we're looking for younger guys and women. I, I like you older guys, too, but we need to get a little bit younger in there with us and uh, help us out, because those kids can get tiring. Right, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about one thing real quick. Uh, I'm going to try not to hold up too much. Uh, we have, uh, a, there's an event each month, and uh, I want to talk about it's called The Return. You've probably seen t-shirts. You've probably seen men wearing stuff. You've probably heard us talking about it. Matter of fact, we have ones going this Wednesday up in Big Rapids. Avi's going. I'm pretty excited for him. I am, uh, his journey. His brother's going with him. Uh, if there's anybody else that is signed up in here, man, I'm, I'm happy. Come talk to me. I, I, I haven't got the list to see who signed up. But if, if, if it's something that you want to do, and that's getting closer to God, getting one-on-one -on -one with the Lord and shutting the world off, you need to go on an event. Next event's in July. There's not one in June, but it's in July, August, September, October, November. It's at uh, theroadmap.org. This is the website you go to, and you, you click on events, and it's called The Return. And I'm sporting the Heroes Return tonight uh, because we got heroes that go through it and first responders. It's amazing. It is, uh, it's one place that you will love to be at, and you will not want to leave. And believe me, because every time I talk to about four or five different guys, it seems like they're up there serving every month now. So uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, Club 56, I'm going to talk about it just a little bit. The purpose that we started Club 56... Uh, we had fifth through first, uh, second grade in this room. I took over the teaching from Boone's wife, Janelle, because she has so much going on in the church. So I took over teaching every other Sunday, fifth through first, or second. And one Sunday, I, was, I felt like it was going good. And was, yeah, but you got like these second graders that are like over here and they're like playing with stuff. And then you got like fifth graders, you can tell they're getting annoyed. 
So my, my, my question was, could we move the fifth grade or maybe the fourth grade and fifth grade like upstairs and leave the little kids downstairs? And of course, when you ask for something small, God usually moves a mountain. And he opened up a door because Mr. Badge's wife, who runs the children's ministry, was like, whoa, how about you want to look at a ministry like this? And we took the sixth grade out of junior high and we moved the fifth grade out of here and we combined them. And I'm telling you right now, what we have found out, we are the only church in the area that does this. Big Res doesn't do it. Greenville doesn't do it. Sparta doesn't do it. And that's probably because they're a little bit smaller, but Greenville doesn't do it. You get fifth and sixth grade, that age group, that's pretty level. You put a sixth grader in with an eighth grader, eh. You put a sixth grader in with high school, no. It, it, it's, just, it's just too much. But we have found out here that if you teach these kids, because these kids are leaving this area, learning about Noah's Ark, learning about uh, Joseph, and all these different like things. Now they, they're going to hop in fifth grade, going into the sixth grade. They're going to hop right into junior high. They're going to start getting hit with some real world stuff. So let's, you know what? Let's try to shape them before they go to junior high. When those sixth graders walk through that door at East or Rockford, North Rockford, that's a big school. They can get lost. So let's teach these kids. What are we teaching them? We are teaching them about Christ. We are teaching them that they were nailed to the cross. They went to the grave with Jesus and they rose up a new creation in Christ. We are teaching them that there's a battle in their mind. We're gonna learn a little bit about that tonight. We, we teach them that, that um, you have two ways to live. You can live by the flesh or by the spirit. It's a lot easier, a lot easier to live by the spirit in certain ways, but it's a heck of a lot easier to live by the flesh in certain ways. It just makes the world seem easier to us. And when they get into middle school and high school, like, it's a lot easier to live by the flesh than to stand your ground and live by the spirit. Um, their identity in Jesus, that's the biggest thing. We want these kids to know who they are in Christ. We don't want them to move on and having doubts. So why do I do it? Because I was about 12 years old when I went down the drain. And a lot of you know my story, fatherless household. So I went down the drain. I mean, I had no good role model in my life that could teach me what it means to be a man, let alone a man of God. So when I see these boys and these girls coming in here and I can pick out the ones that are struggling at home because their role model at home is not a godly person, not a godly man. That's why I, I, I recommend every man to go to a return because when you know what, when you fix a man, you fix a family. When, when, you, when you heal a heart, you heal a family. When those chains come off, they come off the whole family, not just the man. So that's why I do it. Uh, I love doing this too, but this, this is really on my heart right now. I'm gonna pray real, for us real quick. And I got a short video for you guys to watch. So Father God, I just lift up these guys tonight. I ask Holy Spirit, come, please come. Let them hear you and not me. Even if it's just one guy that gets something out of this tonight, Father God, that's, that's the one that you chose. Spirit, come, we invite you. You are welcome here. Father, let them hear you, not me. Let them feel you. Let them understand you. Let them know who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And your daughter is precious. She is. You know, there are days I wish she had a brother or sister. I go grocery shopping and occasional doctor's visit. And my girlfriends and I get together on Friday afternoons for coffee. <laughs> Other than that, I read a lot and I spend time with Jesus. I used to spend so much time with my girlfriends before my <laughs> job. Give me your money right now. Did you hear me? Both of you give it to me now. Okay, okay, we will. Just please put the knife down. Do it and do it now. No. Now you put that knife down right now in the name of Jesus. And you believe he was early 20s? Yeah, maybe 25. So let me get this straight. He was pointing a knife at you, and you told him to put it down in Jesus' name. Right. Now when you write that down, don't leave out Jesus. People always leaving Jesus out. 
That's one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in. Yes, ma'am. You know, what concerns me is that you could have easily been killed. Well, I know a lot of people probably would have given them that money. I understand that. But that's their decision. Are you not eating your ice cream, Elizabeth? No, I'm not hungry anymore. Well, let me help you with that. No reason to waste perfectly good ice cream. No, that's good. Mm-hmm. So that clip popped in my head uh, the other day when I was thinking about when, when people live in fear of the world. And it's like, wait a second. We have power in us. Um, so this whole study, there's been a lot of like different things that I've, I, I've noticed from guys teaching in different areas. And this, the, 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 the fear of the Lord Man, if you were to say that on the street, you are not going to get the best response. You need to come to church and fear the Lord. I guarantee you will not get a good response. So I want to talk to you guys, and I'm going to pull a verse out of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, a lot of people say, well, that was a pretty judging God. Well, no, that's a very loving God in the Old Testament. So Deuteronomy 7, 9, I don't have any verses for you guys. I didn't get that far. Now, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keeps his commands. Man, that sounds like a loving God. That sounds like a father that really cares about us. See, God knew we were going to be living in times like this. God knew that um, we were going to have struggles. And I, I've been listening to a lot of different pastors, and they compare it today as chapter 11 in Genesis. That's what's going on in America and in the world. And, and God knew this was going to happen. So as, as we, as, as men of the church, followers in Christ... If we look back at, I love, love this, Deuteronomy 7, 9, and we know as we are the thousands of generations that came after this, that, that those who love him keep his commandments. You know, he has specific commandments for us. We don't got to talk about the 600 and something laws. We're looking at the commandments that most, that most people, even if they don't believe in God, will sit back and say, well, that's a pretty moral person. That's, that's, that's a pretty honest person. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not sleep with your neighbor's wife. You know, that's, that's a pretty moral standard across the board, even if you don't believe in God. At least I would hope so. I mean, even when I didn't believe in God, I, I thought that was a pretty moral standard. So we had a verse in the book, and uh, it was Psalms 31, 19 through 20. Who read the chapter? I got one hand. I got two hands. Thanks for the honesty, guys. I got her popping up. I did, I did it. So I changed the word, kind of phrased some things a little bit different in this. So I'm not rewriting the Bible. Don't start throwing stuff at me. But I just want to hear it from a different perspective. So if you don't know what word I changed, it might stick out to you. So it's Psalms 31, 19 through 20. Oh, how abundant is your goodness which you have stored up for those who are in awe of you and work for those who take refuge in you in sight of the children of mankind in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of the men. You store them in your shelter for the strife of tongues. Today, people are not taking refuge. For those who are in awe of you. I just switched awe. I took fear out and put awe in. So I was, I was doing some digging, and I might not be a Bible scholar. Matter of fact, I was telling somebody, you guys are going to, you know, I hope there's like, you know, grace and no judgment up here. I graduated third from the bottom of my class. So I'm 
most likely if you were a smart person in a boardroom, you would say that I'm most, probably the most unqualified to be up here. That's just, that's just, that's just what pr perspective of what people would say. Graduated third from the bottom of my class. I had a very small class. So there was 47 other kids that were smarter than me by GPA grade. So I had a very small class. Well, we had 55, but five or four in exchange students they didn't count. Um, but for those who are in awe of God, so I, I wanted to figure out this awe of God, and I wish I would have put this up there. So I started Googling and doing this, and if you take the, ver the words, fear thy Lord, and I asked, okay, what does this mean in Hebrew? And the thing that popped up was the root word of that phrase, fear thy Lord, is Yaira. And Yaira means awe. Or it can also be uh, replaced with fear, respect, and honor. Honor your Lord. <clears throat> respect thy Lord. So I want to sit back and say, okay, men who live in the awe of God, we know no boundaries in life. We know no boundaries in life. We go on wild goose chases, like we, what we read about last fall. We throw on our full armor like we went through this winter because we know no boundaries. We're going. We're going where we need to go. No boundaries. Our purpose becomes greater than our jobs, our hobbies, the stock market, what car we drive, whose small group we're in. Some men live in such a way they walk I have a typo here. We're going to stop right there. I, I typed something wrong. Please forgive me. Uh, but those men who live in the awe of God have no boundaries. I don't put all my awe in little things that don't matter. I don't put all my awe, like, ooh, ah. See, when I think of awe, I don't think of the fear. I think of awe. I'm, like, I'm looking at God like, man, he is, that's awe. I want, I want to look at God like I remember my daughters when they were little, like when, they, when, they would, when I'd come home from work and they'd be standing there waiting for me. And I'd walk in and they'd just be happy. They'd be, they're just a joy, full of joy, waiting. And then you can tell the guys that don't live in the awe of God or the people, I'm not picking on nobody. Don't, don't think I'm picking on you. They're the ones that come through the door a little late. And it's a different story if, if you have a reason to be late. But if you just don't like to get here on a Sunday morning, grab your cup of coffee, slowly walk in for worship, kind of sit in the back, put your head down, like, okay, looking at the clock. Like, it's hard to worship the Lord when you got a coffee cup in your hand. It's hard to praise the king when you're not mentally ready, when you're not trying to cast out what's on the outside and being focused on the Lord. It's hard to understand what that means when you have so many distractions going on because you were on your way to church and you're fighting with your wife and believe me, I've been down this road and I've had to teach before, after all this. When, when the enemy slides in and decides you know what, I have a plan today because I decided not to live fully in the awe of God and I allowed some things to slip in. Having a hunger for the Lord is understanding who he is. This all fits together. Having a hunger for the Lord is understanding who he is. We used to sing a song and said, he's a comforter. He's always, we can always approach him. A lot of people have a bad perspective of God. Bad perspective of God. And, and Jesus went to the cross so we could have a relationship with him. 
And there's people that still don't understand that we have a living God that we can talk to directly and not have to worry about anything. He's a non-judging God. Soon as you gave your life to Christ, he made you new. You have full access to that man. You have full access to the heavenly father because his son went to the cross for us. He took my spot on the cross. The veil was torn. And we were able to be with God. Some places have it a little bit different, a little backwards today. I mean, we can, we can go all the way back to the beginning. Look at Adam and Eve walking side by side with the Lord. Walking through the garden with God. I couldn't imagine what that looks like. And then all of a sudden, a lie. A lie pops in. Did God really say you can't do that? Does God really say this? And Eve starts doubting everything. And next thing you know, they realize what they did and they are ashamed. They're hiding. They're fearful. And God's walking around looking for them. I couldn't imagine living that way anymore. I know a lot of men that live that way. A lot of men that, that chose to look at God through the lens of their father on earth. My, God, my dad wasn't around. So God was distanced, non-existent, nothing. There was no God. Closest thing I had to a dad was for a little bit, but he was a drunk. He was mentally and physically abusive. That was the closest thing that I got. And then the other men in my life, they weren't godly men. They weren't, they weren't coming to church on Monday nights. They weren't going to church on Sunday mornings. So a lot of men look at, at God and a lot of people. And a matter of fact, there's a lot of kids over in that classroom that see God like their earthly father. It snaps real fast. Touchy. Don't, don't, don't interrupt him during the game. Or maybe he's too over the top protective, too, too cautious. What do they call that? A helicopter parent or something like that? It's always hovering around. I, I couldn't I couldn't imagine that. You gotta let kids have some freedom. You gotta let them break some bones and skin some knees. I couldn't imagine my wife or kids fearing me. I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't imagine walking through my house and my wife fear me. It would be the same as if I feared God like that. I couldn't imagine my wife not being able to come up to me and ask me a simple question or making a, a simple mistake. Because we don't, we don't rule over our wives like that. Last I knew, God created Eve from the side of man so she could walk side by side with man not below us, she's not above us, side by side. I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine my wife, me putting fear in my wife to where she felt I was the ruler. And that's not what God does to us. He doesn't put fear in us to make us tremble. Holy fear is different than fear. Because if I walked around every single day looking over my shoulder, am I making a mistake today, God? What did I do? I wouldn't live a pretty pleasant life. Love it. Pastor Doug says it on Sundays all the time. That credit card of grace. Give me some. I need it. I messed up today. I need it. I need it. My kids, my daughters, there's no way I would ever put fear in my kids, my daughters. I need them to trust me. And if guys are walking around not trusting God because they're scared of him, just like if my daughters were walking around not trusting me, they're going to go find a boy who can shave with our, their arms wide open waiting for those two girls. I want those girls to come to me. I want them to walk up to me with any issue, any problem. I 
can't scare them away. That's what the Father does for us. We have full access to him. We get to go right to him. Even if it's on our worst day possible, we get to go to him no matter what. No matter what. Kind of what Boone was saying about the tapping out thing. A lot of men, they get fearful. They get fearful because maybe, maybe their wife doesn't give them the respect they think they need. So that, 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 that lie goes into their mind. Or she's not giving me the imp, int, uh, intimacy that I deserve. So that lie goes into my mind. So they start go, okay, well, I can get that from a relationship at work. Eh, it's just casual talk. Or I can click on a website. I can find that intimacy that I like. No. God doesn't want that. Think about what triggers someone to either fear or not want anything to do with God. Just the little things, they're lies. It says in John 8, 44, right at the end of the verse that he is a liar and he is the father of lies. Lies trigger fear. It always starts with a lie. It started with a lie in the, in the garden and it's still going today. God has proven through so much scripture in the Bible that he is a loving, forgiving, awesome father, but we still have people that either A, don't believe it, or B, you know what, eh, there's some things that I don't like. Well, that doesn't matter what you like, it's what, it's what God says. See, the world today is trying to defeat us with fear. It's trying to defeat us with fear. I, I listened to Jonathan Kahn. I like that guy. Um, a matter of fact, I got to see him a couple times. He was here. Wasn't he here at this church? Big res, I know that. I was there. So he, he was talking about these three things, but the one he talked about, America is under a demonic presence of confusion, big time. And it's not, tri it's not coming after us. It's going after our kids. It's going after the generation, the young generation. They're trying, the confusion of all the stuff that's going on. Sexual things. All the lies that's being told to these, this young generation. I couldn't... A lot of people don't want to trust God or believe in God because it doesn't line up with their agenda. See, we all knew what happened in the Old Testament. We all know. We, we heard about the flood. God got fed up. We know what he can do. I was talking to, uh, I was talking to my, my I, I, would, I decided to go back to the gym. And I'll tell you what, the gym is a lot like a church. There's a lot of comparisons. And it's scary. Then the, the lies start going back into your mind. Like, well, you're out of shape. You can't lift as much no more. People are going to laugh at you, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like a church. You walk in, you know, you're, you're sitting back in the back row. You're like, well, this guy's way more spiritual than I am. This person's raising their hands. This person's down on the floor speaking in a crazy language. Like, just that fear sets in. And those lies start to trigger you. And I told him today, I said, you know, I thought about getting a big thing of ants and like putting them on here and like stepping on them. That's what God could do if he really wanted to. He's like, yeah, then you'd probably, you know, have PETA all up in here. Or I don't know. So we, we decided not to, I decided not to do that. But we know, like, in a perspective, like, we are as small as ants in God's eyes. We know what he can do. We know exactly what God can do. But that's the beauty of the awe of God, is because we also know the love that he has. We also know the love that he wants to give us. He, lo he loves us so much, he gave us his son. He gave us his son. That's how much he loves us. Um, but when fear enters people's minds and they start believing it, like this, I'm, I'm not trying to poke at people, but this, this, this generation of, of, of confusion that's going on in the schools and are you a boy, are you a girl, are you this, are you that, all these lies. These kids at the beginning decided, 
I don't want to believe in God because God is a right-wing conservative. No, he's not. Not even close. He'd be sitting at the table with all the people in that house. Doesn't matter what side of the aisle they sit on. Because he wants the person. He wants the person's heart. He doesn't want their politics. He doesn't want their beliefs of that stuff. We all know, we teach the kids over there, we all know there's only, two, there's only two identities in this world. There's only two. That's a believer or a non-believer. That's all it is. You don't, get to, you don't get to identify as anything else other than a believer or a non-believer. Because once you start identifying as something else, it just gets too confusing. And then when, when, when people, they, when they get nervous or they get fearful of God, they start reading scripture the wrong way. They don't know how to open the Bible and read it correctly. Then they start looking at scripture like Philippians 4.13. I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, wait, did I say that wrong? Sometimes Christ will help me. Oh, here, here we go. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but except, come over, except get over sin. See, when, when you fear God the wrong way, you read the scriptures wrong. When people fear God the wrong way, they read the scriptures wrong. And I did that when I first got into the Bible 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I can't remember now. I stayed out of the Old Testament. Too confusing. First of all, too many genealogy things. I'm like, duh, 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 mom, dad, whatever. But I stayed out of the Old Testament because it was too confusing. It was too much going on. I'm like, wait a second. What's going on here? So what we have to understand, and I'm going to use this. I'm not the best at this. Jeff, I'm sorry. You got to see this yesterday. I didn't do it, though, so it was much better. <laughs> This is us. When we accept Jesus, our spirit, it's sealed. It's righteous. It's made perfect in God's eyes. It's going to heaven. Our bodies aren't going to heaven, but our spirit is. Our soul, this is the third part, second part of us. It's like our emotions, how we feel. And then this part right here. This is, this is the troubling part. The body. This part right here. Because this part, you know, today, I had a good workout in. Then I'm at home putting Cool Whip on top of pound cake and just eating it because it tastes good. But see, this part here, this part's going to fail. That's why we die. This part here, it's not going to stay healthy. But this part doesn't have to be perfect to make it to heaven because he already made this, per this spot perfect. He's already sealed it. He's already grabbed a hold of you. You went down into the grave with him and came out in him. You are in Christ. You don't need to, I shouldn't say this, you do need to worry about this. But it's not a get out of free jail car. Like, it's not giving you the ability to go do what you want. But if you're chasing Jesus, if you're chasing the Lord and you know you're making mistakes, but you want to get up and you want to try it again and you want to get up and you want to try it again and you want to get up and you want to try it again, but you know the end game is, is Jesus. You keep doing that. He's going to keep working with you because that part's not sanctified till you make it to heaven. That part's not 100% till you make it to heaven. And last I read, we're going to get a new body. We're going to have a new body that's going to do all kinds of cool things, I guess. I know, I, I hear Pastor I, Boone's dad say it all the time. Might be, like, be able to fly or jump through walls or something. I'm all about that. My kid can't wait. But when we live in fear, the wrong fear, and the lies start coming at us, who's seen the Lion King? 
So if you've not seen The Lion King, there's two versions. There's a cartoon version and there's a live version. In the, in the, in the hyenas, they trap Simba. He's the, little, he's the next to the lion. He's the next to be the king. And they trap him. And, and, and they're taunting him. So what's a, what's a little boy, a little lion boy do? Gives him a little roar. Rawr. And they, they all laugh at him. Until, until we understand who our father is, this is us. We're backed in a corner. We have our lies in front of us, and we're going, wow. But in the movie, Simba doesn't know this, and all of a sudden, he gets ready to do another roar, and it's, Rawr! I hope you all like that. And the hyenas run off, and he doesn't pay attention, but his father's standing behind him. That's our father. That's our Lord. That's our king. Most kings stand in the back. Most kings stand in the back while their pawns fight wars. Our king went to the front line and decided to finish it for us. So when I sit back and say, you know what? I don't walk in fear. Because Apostle Paul says, if I die, I gain. I'm not going to stand in fear when, when, when God has already given me the victory. I already know the victory. I already know the outcome. I already know what's going to happen. If there's one verse in this book, and I'm going to read it out of the book. I love reading the Bible, like physically reading it. it it's, it's something about it. This is the verse that I would honestly recommend. It's 1 John 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. Last I knew, Jesus was perfect. Jesus was perfect. He went to the cross. I'm going to be closing up here in a second. Our last study on the, on the, on the armor of God, a question popped up. And I'm not going to lie, I looked around the room. And I was like, whoa, the feeling that I got, and maybe I, maybe I was I misplaced, I don't know. But the question was on your salvation. Are you 100% going to heaven? Are you 50% going to heaven? Are you 25% going to heaven? And I looked around, I was like, whoa, wait a second. Because I'm gonna tell you this right now, if that's something that you don't know, if that's something that you're battling with right now, if that's something that maybe, uh, I think I am, that's a lie going through your mind. And that's the enemy trying to separate you from God using fear. Now your fear is, am I gonna make it? Am I good enough? No, you ain't good enough, that's why Jesus came. What do I gotta do? Nothing. You don't have to do anything. Jesus already did it. Well, then wait, then why am I questioning this? So Boone made a great uh, point about 100 kids in the children's thing. We did a lock-in three weeks ago. I had 91 kids, plus or minus five kids, because they kept coming and going. 91 kids here on a lock-in, mini lock-in. I don't spend the night. And I gave these kids an opportunity. An opportunity to make sure when they left tonight, that they knew, first of all, where they were going. They knew, they knew that when they walked out, who their Lord was. I asked every single kid, sorry, I'm not a big fan of bow your eyes, close your, close your, bow your head, close your eyes. This is between you. No, I want you to show the world 
who you follow. If you can sit there and cheer for the Detroit Lions and jump up and down, but you're ashamed to stand up for God and worship him? That makes no sense to me. Oh, wait, because that's what the world perceives. They don't like that. They look at us like Ned Flanders from The Simpsons. The world thinks that we're just a bunch of pushovers. Nah, I'll test that theory outside with anybody. Just we'll push. We're not going to get in no physical altercation. But I ain't no pushover. Not when I got the king behind me. Because he ain't going to let me go backwards. Can I have that picture? That's over 80 kids bound together, surrendering their life to the Lord or making Jesus their king. Yeah, maybe some was emotion. But I'll tell you what, those are kids. And the thing is, is there was a bunch of adults behind them. So they didn't have a choice of being hidden in there. The adults were behind them. Their parents were coming in at that time. Eighty-something kids, almost 90 kids right there. Because I asked them to come up here and say, you know what? Show me who your Lord is. Tell me. Get up here. And I'm going to give you guys the same opportunity. I'm going to ask Boone, I'm going to ask Charlie, and I'm going to ask Randy to come up here. I want you three men just to come up here. We're getting ready to break for the summer. We're getting ready to leave for the summer. I hope you guys stay in contact with each other. I hope you guys stay in small groups with each other. But I don't want anybody to leave here tonight guessing that salvation, first of all. Am I saved? I don't want anybody to leave here tonight saying, you know what? I don't think I've ever made Jesus my Lord. I made him my my Savior, but is he my Lord? Is he what Boone said? Don't look at your phone, read scripture first in the morning. Is he who you think of before you put your feet on the floor? Is he the person that you run to for every little thing? So we're gonna play another worship song. You're all gonna stand up. You're gonna pray and you're gonna ask yourself, have I made Jesus Lord? Am I I saved 100%? Take that time and I want you to come up to one of these men if that's something that you're doubting. They're gonna pray with you and they're gonna make sure when you leave here tonight that you are sealed. You are on your way, and then you have an opportunity because I'm gonna tell you right now, there's a lot of men that I know sat in church for the last 10 to 20 years, and as soon as they went to a return, they said, guess what? I was never really saved, or I was never really made Jesus my Lord. Are you kidding me? We gotta figure that out. This is something we shouldn't be stumbling with because it's us that's on the front lines today. We're the ones going in the front lines. We're the men of the church. We're not Ned Flanders. We're the men of the church.